Hey guys, I'm Dr. Buffy, and today I'm super excited to have a conversation with two of my really great friends. We call ourselves the Three Amigos, and we're gonna have a conversation about infection prevention and control and antibiotic stewardship. Dr. Ellingson, thank you so much for joining today. Just wanna provide a brief background for us. Yeah, always a pleasure, Buffy. I'm glad to be here. Um, my name is, is Kate Ellingson. I am an epidemiologist at the University of Arizona. So I'm on faculty in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, and I study healthcare associated infections, antimicrobial resistance, and have done a lot of work throughout the pandemic on infection prevention and occupational health. Um, so I'm really happy to be here and, and antimicrobial stewardship is um, a passion of mine and the research that I got started before the pandemic is, is still relevant throughout the pandemic and will be when we're on the other side. So, um, you know, I, I think um, understanding stewardship in the post COVID era is, is also something I'm really interested in pursuing here. Yeah, so thank you so much. And also Dr. Peter Patterson is with us too. And I'll just have you do a brief intro as well. Sure. Well, I've uh, been uh, working in uh, post-acute care for the last half decade or more, and uh, <clears throat> I started doing antibiotic stewardship in post-acute facilities, similar to the idea that it was in hospitals before. And the, the difference that, uh, is I got started with a nurse, uh, an ADON, uh, Assistant Director of Nursing, at uh, Glencroft, and we developed a protocol uh, that got great results in antibiotic stewardship. And so uh, in the course of time, we made a difference in our own facility. And uh, then the American Medical Directors Association gave us a best practice award. And so our reputation was uh, increasing, if you like. And then uh, uh, I got meet, to meet Kate a couple of years back uh, when I did a presentation in Tucson. And we got uh, working together and she uh, applied for a grant to further the antibiotic stewardship protocol that I developed and spread it more broadly in facilities uh, throughout the state. So that's basically how we came to be working with each other and now with you all on the same thing. So so that's that's wonderful. And, and Dr. P, why, do we, why are we the three amigos? <laughs> well, I think that that uh, we actually the insight that we have that's uh, a little bit unique and not everybody has it is that the thing that makes a difference is being in the facilities and doing yes. work with the people there. The tendency for especially for uh, government departments and regulatory agencies is to kind of uh, produce mi missives, you know, like issue orders, you know, from on high and has the people to comply with that. And it, it's not very effective. What really works uh, is uh, working with the facility directly and especially uh, having them realize, uh, recognize that we're not out to find fault. Right. We're actually out to see the things they're doing well and then stand on top of that and do the next things and the next things well. So that's that's the secret of the three amigos in my view. <laughs> and we're fairly unique in that. And we're we're looking up for opportunities to do that, you know, to actually leverage that idea, you know, and we've got enough background between the three of us that it, it's uh, potentially something pretty powerful if we can just get the right support and, you know, the right the, the right other amigos you know, rather than the three amigos, you know, because we aren't going to do it by ourselves. No, so, you know. <laughs> for sure. So Dr. Ellingson, you know, I'd love to hear more about this grant that you and Dr. Patterson are working on and, and the importance of the grant. We, we started to learn a little bit more of how it came to be with the best practice. And so where are you with that? And, and you know, you talked about the post-COVID era. Where, where do we take this into the future as well? Um, well, yeah, thank you for asking about this, this grant really, um, you know, as, as Dr. Pete described after I met him and heard about this intervention that had shown success, had shown sort of a reduction in antimicrobial prescribing without adverse consequences, without, you know, residents getting injured or any adverse events, um, but yet a decrease in prescribing, a decrease in C. diff. 
I thought, you know, this is something that um, needs to be scaled. And so really the approach with the grant was to take this protocol that had worked because of, you know, sort of its intensive on-site and personal touch and figure out, you know, how do we actually, how do we scale this up? And there were some really important components of that protocol that included things we know work like data feedback, but it was really the way in which um, data feedback, such as prescribing rates, were, were given back to providers. Who provided those rates back to them? How was that information delivered um, that I thought were really compelling? Um, and the other piece of it was the emphasis on training at all levels of the sort of so-called medical hierarchy that exists in any medical facility. So Dr. Pete's protocol really focused on not just family and residents, uh, but the environmental health services workers who are often close to the bedside, the CNAs, the nurses, and it really sort of honored the role that each person plays in that, you know, cascade of information that leads to, to antibiotic prescribing with the idea that, hey, if we can, if we can modify this, this chain of events, maybe we can actually prevent unnecessary prescribing. So I really liked that sort of whole staff training approach too. And so what we did was try to formalize the protocol with this grant. Um, and before we put it into action, we did on-site interviews with 55 employees in these settings. We strategically sampled facilities across the state of Arizona. We wanted to have borders, border facility representation, rural health facility representation. And then we you know, randomly sampled from the, the Phoenix-Tucson corridor. Um, and we, when we got into these 10 facilities, we strategically interviewed um, from you know four to six people, from the administrator to uh, prescribing physician to nurse to CNA to um, environmental health services workers. We interviewed them sometimes in Spanish um, at these facilities as well, and we asked to them. Uh, we performed what we call semi-structured key informant interviews, where we asked them a, a common series of questions. We had prompts. And um, what we learned is that the people at the at, at the administrative higher level often knew exactly how to uh, the right answers in terms of how to implement an antibiotic stewardship program. And sometimes that that knowledge didn't necessarily transcend all the way down the chain in terms of, you know, the people at the bedside who are actually working with the patients. Um, had very different ideas, um, talked about challenges that the administrators hadn't recognized, such as intense family pressures um, or just kind of a culture of prescribing both in the community as well as in the medical setting. So we tried to summarize these findings and and um, and use them to create sort of this, this standardized protocol that we felt could be scaled. That sounds like really amazing work. And I'm so glad that you and Dr. Patterson have been able to work on this grant. So this was before COVID. So how has COVID impacted the work and, and what's going on now? Well, the first thing it did, I have to say, is it stopped our grant uh, progress in its tracks because facilities were totally consumed with dealing with the outbreak and they didn't have any time for antibiotic stewardship or really anything else. And I would just add that we had formed close relationships with these facilities. And so when the pandemic hit and they were in crisis, um, many of our close collaborators on site said, we just cannot implement anything extra. We are dealing with you know this, this new virus and um, we need your help in terms of figuring out what to do, how to interpret guidance. And so, we found ourselves in a position that was sort of unique. And in fact, the um, Pima County where I live, the health director actually approached me and said, you know, these facilities help us with this emergency response. And so um, so we shift, we shifted gears. We sort of leveraged our connections with the facilities. And, you know, while the health departments are busy trying to coordinate, you know, testing and contact tracing and everything else they were strained with. Um, they're also trying to, you know, help our facilities interpret guidance. Um, and I think one of the things that I learned from Dr. Buffy and Dr. Pete is the importance of being on site. And so um, yeah. I felt confident, you know, go, going on site, working with people with whom I had established relationships and, and even being part of a couple of um, outbreak investigations early on in the pandemic, uh, where we were able to get in site and, and build on the trust we had built. And 
Um, so I think that um, that was that was a really important thing, and I'm glad we were able to to help them there. And on the other side of that, we couldn't do our broad implementation project that we had planned with the grant, but our funders actually allowed us to reallocate some of our funding to assist with outbreak investigation under you know developing protocols for monoclonal antibody administration um, on site. And also, um, and also to actually do uh, a new project aim that would look at how antimicrobial prescribing changed throughout the pandemic. So we're in the course of doing a large um, abstra data abstraction project with one of the large facilities that we work with, and we're actually tracking, um, you know, prescribing through the pandemic. And so um, it will be interesting to to share those results and hear hear your your thoughts on the interpretation, both of you. So. So thanks for that great explanation regarding the the work that you're doing and really where where COVID kind of put everything um, at pause. And I love that you were able to shift and pivot as the whole world did during has during this pandemic and put your focus towards um, the outbreak response. And it's so critical and important, like what you were describing and Dr. Patterson was describing is that we're in the building. You know, this is, this is non-traditional really. And, and this is where our long-term care, our providers, the frontline staff, our housekeepers, they need us. They need us working side by side with them so that we can offer them solutions and I love what you mentioned too about trust because this industry is so punitive that tr building trust and building relationships is everything. I don't care how much help you can offer and provide, if there is not a level of trust or relationship, it's not gonna happen. So I really appreciate you bringing um, those topics up. So really, you know, we're, we're still in the middle of this pandemic. And so maybe both of you could just describe a little bit like, how do we offer our long-term care facilities the best support right now with what we can do? And, and really, you know, what, what is the path forward? So we're still in the middle of this pandemic. And really, I'd like to hear briefly from both of you, what is the best path going forward and how we can truly support our long-term care facilities? Well, I think the from my perspective anyway, I think I, I love the the stages that we're we're building with with the Epic Grant, for example, we're building on a foundation of the things that are required by regulation and having people see it in another light. Uh, my old mentor from years ago would ask the question, if there were no laws and regulations mm -hmm. and world-class quality care was your goal. How much of this that's required by regulation would you not be doing if you wanted to have a complete system, a, a whole system? And that's a very good question to ask. So that's part the kind of work that we're doing to set them up for seeing things in a new light. And in that regard, I think the monthly calls that we are doing with the infection preventionists that we do by Zoom every month are are very key to that. And they're, they're a lot of fun now. Mm -hmm. And people like, it's amazing how many people we have administrators on, on the call. And I'm sure some directors of nursing in there and as well as some IPs. So we've really got the key players and we're now like setting up an entry. Like I always end up my part saying, ask for an on-site visit. Mm -hmm. so we're willing to do that. So right. I see that's that's basically the work now that's in front of us is to get into as many facilities as we can and have them adopt the work, the kind of protocols that we know how to do. Yeah, great. Yeah, I would agree that one of the, you know, the best things we can do to support long-term care facilities is really support the staff in those facilities through some of the, the types of things that Dr. Pete was, was just talking about, as well as, you know, thinking, thinking more, um, uh, thinking more broadly about how we can support them in terms of, you know, um, can we advocate for, for, uh, you know, a career path for these, right. can we retain people longer? Because as everyone who's worked with long-term care facilities know, there's a very high turnover rate. And so when we're trying to implement, you know, mindful COVID-19 protocols um, that require like levels of awareness in multiple domains, or we're trying to implement antimicrobial stewardship, which requires 
um, you know, thoughtful communication and understanding of the issues, you know, having staff that um, have been retained, feel ownership over their position um, and feel empowered to to um, to do what they do, which is actually save lives and right. prevent unnecessary medication use. I mean, these are it's a really big deal. But I think in sort of the the busyness to cover care um, and and sort of the the staffing shortages that we see now, it's it's really hard to. Um, you know, to, to support the staffs at the level that they need to be responsible for these kinds of interventions that we want to implement. So that's why my focus has in somewhat shifted a bit. Um, I'm still interested in stewardship and infection prevention, but I've realized that we need to address occupational health and wellness first. Yes. And so um, that's actually sort of a new thread of my, you know, the grants I'm trying to write in the future always incorporate something about how, how we can engage employees and how we can actually improve their working conditions, because that's, that's the way that we, we move towards a more healthy system for everybody. Well, I love that so much. And, and I agree with both of you. We, we need to get in the buildings. We need to provide the support, work side by side. And then we need to address our healthcare workers and our staff, all of the staff that work within these, these healthcare settings. We need to address their mental health, their physical health. They're, you know, they're not just robots, you know, working themselves to death here. We really, really need to support them. And, you know, we've all experienced, I've experienced it and, and we need that, we need that support. So I thank you so much for joining me today. I, I love the work that we're, we're championing and, and look forward to continued work and ongoing conversations.